session three. And what I'm going to do in this session is build upon a message I preached a couple weeks ago. And this message was based on Jesus Christ being the resurrection and the life. And uh, th in this message, one of the things I talked about is that we are either going to live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or we're going to live from the tree of life. And so that's what we talked about in that message. But in this message, I kind of want to talk about, or I want to talk about how to live from the tree of life. So let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 15. And what I want to do is just kind of, uh, just, I'll probably summarize just a little bit of what we talked about in that message. But uh, in John chapter 15, Jesus lays out for us how to live by the tree of life. And if you have, you know, no matter how long you've been a Christian, I'm just finding this out for my own myself. I probably have, I have been following the Lord wholeheartedly for 20 years and probably for 15 years I was eating from the wrong tree even as a Christian and you know the tree of the knowledge of good and evil I believe most and I, I don't say this exaggerating I believe most Christians that would include us who are listening and that would include me live more from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil than from the tree of life and what I mean by that is what, what, what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil did is it defined for us by knowledge what is good and what is evil. And then in our own power, our own soul power, our own strength, our own self-life, we do our best to do the good and to avoid the evil. And we use the Bible to define for us, this is good and this is evil. And then in our own knowledge based on brain power, soul power, self-life, our own strength and ability, we try everything we can to do good and to avoid evil. And if we succeed in that, what happens then is we, we get proud, we get self-righteous, and we get judgmental. If we fail at living from that tree, and we don't really think of it in terms of a tree, but if we fail doing good and avoiding evil, we come under shame, guilt, and condemnation. And I mean, does that, that define so much of the church today? Is the Lord wants us to live not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but from the tree of life. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord is after in his church, is how do we live from the tree of life, who is Jesus Christ? How do we live from that tree? How do we learn to draw from his life? How do we learn to not live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil anymore, but to draw from his life? That's the question. That's what we want to look at in this session, is how do we live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ? Now, in John 15, John 15 is probably, especially John 15, 1 through 11, is one of the most important scripture verses or passages of scripture that we could ever know how to live by. I remember dad growing up had a coffee cup that said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And I remember, I don't know, I was 10 years old or something. I remember seeing that coffee cup and going, that's, what does that mean, you know? But John 15 is an incredible passage of Scripture. And in that message I did a couple weeks ago, I said that the tree of life is more likely like a vine than like an apple tree or an orange tree. The tree of life is more like a vine. And I believe in John 15, the Lord is coming and he's telling us, I'm going to show you how to live from the tree of life. You've been living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for so, so, so long. I'm now going to show you here is how to live by the tree of life. That's what John 15 is about. That's what abiding in the vine is all about. 
And what I want to do in this session is I don't want to just give a teaching. I want to actually talk about how do we do it. I want to make this really practical, as practical as I can, because I'll be honest, I am just at the beginning of learning how to do this myself. But it's making a tremendous impact, a tremendous difference. I'm, I'm going to teach you what I've learned, what's helped me, so hopefully you too can learn to no longer live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. We want to talk about how do we live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of the, that's the focus of what we're going to talk about here in this session. And so Jesus said, I am the true vine. He's the tree of life. Think of it this way. I am the tree of life, and my Father is the vine dresser. See, the Father is the one who is, who is cultivating the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that, he bear, that bears fruit, he prunes it so that you may bear more fruit. So what we have is Jesus is the tree of life. The Father is the vine dresser. We are the branches that are connected into the vine who is the source of life. He is the Zoe life of God. He is the divine, indestructible, un uncreated, resurrecting life of God that is now dwelling inside of us. We are now connected to him, and the Father is the vine dresser that makes sure we are bearing fruit. Now, pruning, he talks about here, pruning is basically the cross working in our self-life, working in our soul to remove the obstructions of self, to remove the self-life, to remove the hindrances, to remove those things that are in our soul, in our heart, that are suppressing and stifling God's Christ and dwelling life from flowing out of our spirit into our heart, into our soul, and outward into our body so that we can produce more and more and more fruit. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? So I'm trying to make this practical for us. Let's turn in our notes to page 7. On page seven in our notes here, we got this, this diagram here. I know the diagram isn't the prettiest, most beautiful diagram you've ever seen, but for me, if I can envision this conceptually, it helps me, the way I think, to know, okay, this is how I abide, because I never really knew, okay, how do you abide? What do you just be quiet? Do you just stay still? Do you just pray? Do you read the Bible? You know, I never really realized, okay, how do you actually do this? Okay, the Lord told us to do this. The Lord told us to live by the tree of life, but how practically do we do that? When we wake up on Monday and we feel terrible because it's Monday and our coffee hasn't kicked in yet, how do we live by the indwelling life that is in us, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so this picture here, I hopefully this will kind of help us. And we're gonna, I wanted to show you the end product of, of what the end product of what it looks like. But in our spirit is the vine. In our spirit is the life. In our spirit is Jesus Christ. In our spirit is Zoe life. In our spirit is the tree of life. And our spirit is now one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says that the one who joined themselves to the Lord is one spirit with him. John in 1 John said, this is how we know we abide in him by his spirit he has given to us. So connection with God is already taking place in your spirit. You can't get any more connected to Christ than you already are in your spirit. You're, you're one spirit with him. And so the goal then is for that life 
in your spirit by him, the Christ, the, the Zoe life of God, for that divine life to flow out of your spirit into your heart, into your soul, and for that life source to be unobstructed so there's no hindrances, there's nothing standing in the way, so that source of life is continually flowing with nothing stopping. And when that happens, when the, the life of God, like, a, like sap running through a vine, is flowing through you as the branch, you will produce fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. I wish I would have learned this 20 years ago, because I'm afraid a lot of what I did is going to not have any benefit in the kingdom. But the Lord said that if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. Now, that does not mean we can't do anything. It means we can do nothing of value to the kingdom of God. Nothing of value to the kingdom of God unless we're abiding in the king who lives inside of us. See, when we stand before the Lord, if we don't want our works to be burned in the fire, if we want to have the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ without, without suffering loss, this imperative that we learn the lesson of the vine, how to abide in the vine, how to live from the Spirit, how to live from the Zoe life of God, how to have Him produce the fruit of His nature, of His character, of who He is in us and through us. So now let's go back to the beginning here. And we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at page page two about Christ dwelling in our heart. This is what I've learned is, and, and, and just I'm just trying to teach, hopefully mentor you to what I've learned, is Christ dwells here, but he does not automatically dwell here in our heart. And what I want to do, my, my first goal is to get Christ in here, dwelling in here without any hindrances, without any obstruction, without anything in my heart that would cause the life of Christ to be suppressed. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3. I want to show you here the conditional language. You know, what I'm teaching has taken me years to learn this, and if you can learn this quickly for me, that's beautiful. <laughs> It'll save you so many years of trying to figure out, okay, what part of me is what? You know, there's a heart, there's a soul, there's a spirit, and, you know, how does all that work together? But in, in verse 17, or actually the, right above and in, in verse 16, Paul's praying that we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And I, and I mentioned in the last session that the inner man is the totality of all that makes us internally, spirit, heart, and soul, the inner man is all of that put together. So Paul's saying that the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God, might strengthen you and that entire inner man. And notice what he said here in verse 17. He said, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. See, there's, condi there's a conditional aspect, aspect to this. Christ does not dwell in our heart automatically. And I know we've kind of taught the children that, hey, just ask Jesus into your heart, but technically, Christ dwells in your spirit. What we want to do, we want to get him into our heart. We want the life of Christ to release into our heart. And Paul's saying here, if, if the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit comes and strengthens your inner man, then Christ who dwells in you will dwell and occupy your heart. And like Solomon said, all the issues of life flow out of the heart. Everything flows out of the heart. Watch over your heart, for out of the heart flows the issues of life. Out of the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everything flows out of the heart. So what we want to do to abide in that natural vine branch relationship 
is we want to get Christ in our spirit dwelling fully without any hindrances or obstructions in our heart. And so kind of what we're, we're looking at here is how do we do that? If you turn to page three, we, we looked at who we are as a creation in, in the last session. I'm just going to review it again just because it's, you know, it's so new to us that we, we don't think like this. We should think like this more. Is the, we have the inner man and the outer man. The outer man, of course, is our body. The inner man is our soul, our heart, and our spirit. Sometimes people get confused and they call the spirit the heart and the heart the spirit. But they're actually distinct. Hebrews 4.12 makes that clear. And so here in this table is, our, is looking at our spirit. Our spirit is the deepest part of our inner man. Our spirit is right here, the deepest part of our inner man. It's where the Holy Spirit dwells. You are connected to Christ right here. So you don't have to try to get any more connected to Christ in your spirit. You're as connected to Christ as you ever will be. You're one spirit with him. It's the part of us that connects directly to God. It's the place where we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Now, the heart is the channel that connects our spirit to our soul. See, our heart right here is partly spirit, partly soul, but it's distinct. That's why I did the circles overlapping each other. The, the heart is the source of our deepest beliefs, our deepest thoughts, our deepest desires, our deepest motives, and our deepest actions. See, the, the heart is where from the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart right here is the deepest part of our being. All our thoughts, our thoughts come from our, um, from our heart. Our, our lips speak from our heart. Our emotions come from our heart. And so we want Christ to rule and reign and dominate and have absolute dominion in our heart. We don't want the self-life ruling in our heart. We want Christ dwelling in our heart. The soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions, and it can be influenced by our heart. See, if, if Christ is living in our heart, our heart can then influence our soul. Our heart can then influence our will of what we do and don't do. Our, our soul is what connects directly to our body and directs our body. So whether we sin or don't sin or whether we live holy or don't live holy, all is a matter of the soul, of the will making that decision. And so if our heart has Christ dwelling in us and he's ruling and reigning in our heart, then our soul can then come under the dominion of Jesus Christ. Now let's look on page four here. I can't stress how important it is that we gain control of our heart. Every single issue of life flows out of the heart, every one of them. That's what, that's what Proverbs says, and, and that's what Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23. He says, it's the spring from which all the issues of life flow. And so... What can happen is our flesh, which is our mind, which is our five senses of our body, and our soul coupled together, that's what the scriptures define as the flesh, our flesh can influence our heart and defile our heart, or our spirit can influence our heart, and Christ who dwells in our heart can dwell there by faith and then influence our soul and our body. Is this making sense? See, our heart contains the deepest part of us. See, our heart can be filled with lust. Our heart can be filled with pride. Our heart can be filled with doubt and unbelief. Our heart can be filled with anger, with anxiety, with bitterness, with unforgiveness, with cold love, with judgment, with criticism, with all these different things. And if those things fill our heart... What happens then is God's life 
Christ's Zoe life in our spirit remains suppressed. And we're not connected fully to the vine. And then divine life is suppressed by the condition of our heart. And that suppression of divine life by the condition of our heart limits the amount and the measure of Christ that can come into our heart. So we need God to cleanse our heart. We need God to remove out of our heart anything that has been influenced by the flesh, pride, judgment, you know, fear, anxiety, depression, whatever it could be. I mean, there's so many different things that, that can happen is we need the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts so that the obstruction and the hindrances are removed so that Christ can dwell in our heart by faith. And so here in this picture, this shows you kind of the getting up to the abiding life is you have in your spirit Christ. And this this prayer, of course, it's not as simple as a prayer, but this, this type of prayer helps get your heart purified and get your heart prepared for Christ to occupy your heart. So I'm going to give you an example here of, and, and this, this prayer, this one I'm about to pray, I pray this, I don't say every single day, but I pray this very regularly. It is, I've found this prayer to be so vital and I want to encourage you to pray like this. To, you know, you don't have to copy it, but pray like this of, of learning to get the, the life of God in you in your heart, dwelling there. We want Christ to dwell in our heart. So here's, the, here's a, a sample of that prayer. Father, I, I just want to pray right now that you would make my heart your dwelling place. Lord, make my heart the dwelling place of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that Christ dwells in my spirit. I, I, I like to say that just to, God knows that, but I like to say to remind myself because I forget that Christ dwells in my spirit. Lord, what an incredible reality that divine life, Zoe life is in my spirit. Lord, I want to be fully possessed by his life. And so God, I just pray, you are the vine dresser. You are the one, Father, that cleanses my heart. Lord, would you cleanse my heart from doubt and unbelief? What what hindrances those doubt and unbelief are to the abiding life? Lord, would you remove pride that creeps in, independence, greed, jealousy, anger, judgment, criticism? Lord, would you purify my heart, Lord, so that Christ can dwell in in my heart without rival. Lord, purify my heart. And then if I'm struggling in something, I would repent and ask God to forgive me and and just say, God, forgive me for this or that or whatever it would be, but the heart, what is is the condition of your heart? And, And ask the Lord to help you in that. Then I would say, Lord, let your, let your cross work in my heart. Circumcise my heart, Lord, like a knife, like a sharp sword. Would you allow your sharp sword to cut away those things that are in me, that are defiling my heart? God, I don't want anything to hinder the full release of the Holy Spirit. Father, I just ask you now... So now that I prayed for the cleansing, that's, that's, probably, that's a vital part of this prayer. Now that I prayed for the cleansing of my heart, is I now want to pray for that strengthening of my heart, the strengthening of God, the, the, the resurrection life of Christ, the Zoe life of Christ, to now release dunamis power, the power of God, to what I call the shift, to shift me out of living by the flesh, living by the soul, living by the five senses, living by the mind, the will, and the emotions, living by desire, to shift me out of that living so that now I'm living by the power of indestructible life. I'm living by the power of resurrection life. I'm living by the Zoe life of God, the indestructible life. So Father, I just pray right now 
And, and I want to encourage you, if you're listening to this, make this a regular part of your prayer. Lord, strengthen my inner man by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I do, this is just something I do, is I say that and I kind of wait on the Lord, just, just, just sensing in my spirit power increasing. And you can, see, I, I, you can feel, I feel it even right into the Lord even right now increasing as I'm praying that. You can feel that, feel him increasing. I feel the Lord even as I'm praying this. I, and I, I don't always feel the Lord, but I do a lot. Lord, let the power of the Holy Spirit, it takes supernatural power to get me out of the flesh. It takes supernatural power to get me out of the soul. The soul exerts great influence over our spirit. It takes the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to give life to your spirit so that then your spirit becomes the leader and your soul becomes the servant. Your heart becomes the servant. And so, Lord, let the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, Lord, begin to strengthen my entire inner man. Lord, let the indwelling life of Jesus Christ that is in my spirit be fully released into my heart. Dwell in my heart by faith, Lord. Occupy my heart without rival. God, that you would just fill my heart until you possess my heart entirely and completely so that I could live the natural, supernatural life of Jesus Christ from the heart. And then Paul talks about in Colossians, he says, put on a heart of love, put on a heart of compassion, put on a heart of humility and joy. Basically, what Paul's saying is, put on Jesus Christ, but you're putting it onto your heart. And just like you go into your closet and you pick out clothes because you already have the clothes and you put those on your body, you already have the nature of Christ in you. So you're putting on what is already in you. You're not asking God, drop this down from heaven, but you're, but you're basically saying, God, I've got this in my spirit. Put this on my heart, love, joy, Peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Put on Christ on your heart just like you would clothing and let the nature of Jesus Christ then fill your heart and him live through you. Make sense? Okay, now page five is we're now moving from the, the spirit of Christ in our spirit moving into our heart, and now we, we want what I've found to be the greatest hindrance to the life of Christ is your soul, the soul life, the independent soul life, the pride, the I can do it myself, the human reasoning that thinks we can figure out God in our mind, and we can have all these thoughts, and we can know the mysteries of God in our mind, that we can through logic and through reasoning figure out and decide and calculate and all estimate and get all these things with our mind to figure all of that out so that we live by brain power, we live by the soul, we live by thoughts, we live by knowledge rather than by Christ. I find that for me the hardest hindrance. The self-will, the independence, the I want to do it this way, I want to do it my way, I want to do it the way I want it, self-preference, the self-life, all that is of the self, the emotions and all of that combined work as just a great force to keep the life of Jesus Christ, the tree of life in you, from flowing out. And so what do we need? We need the cross. We need the vine dresser. We need the Father to come and to release his pruning work in our soul. Now, we don't like that because that means pain. 
We don't like that because that means we may not get what we want. We don't like that because, to be honest, we love ourselves. And that's why the, the church doesn't talk about the cross very much because the church is in love with themselves. But we need the cross to come and work inside of our self-life so that Christ in us can be released. Let's look at John chapter 12, verse 24. As Jesus said that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Notice the connection, much fruit, with John 15, much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. That word life in the Greek is suke. That means soul, the soul life. What Jesus is saying, he's taking us back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's saying if you love your self-life, which was puffed up and raised up by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you love that, you will lose your soul. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go to hell. It just means the development of your soul into the nature and the character of Jesus Christ is lost. But if... If you hate it in this world and keep it to life eternal, you will have it to life eternal. Now, Watchman Nee, this is, I love what Watchman Nee said about this. He said that there is life in the grain of wheat, but there's a hard outer shell that restricts this life from being released. He said, until the outer shell is split open and broken, the wheat, and the sp the wheat cannot sprout and grow. The, the issue is not whether or not we have life. The issue is whether the hard outer shell of the soul has been dealt with. See, the issue is whether the cross has worked in the self-life. The issue is whether the cross of Jesus Christ has come to put to death experientially the self-life to where we can say with Paul, I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. And it's no longer I who live, it's Christ in me who lives. I'm no longer living by the self-life, the, the, the soul life, the suke life. I'm living by the zoe life of Jesus Christ. See, that hard outer shell of the soul has to be broken by the work of the cross so that the life of God that's already in you can flow out. And so that you can exchange your self-life for the beautiful life of Jesus Christ. Now let's look on page six here. Is, is now we see the, the Spirit of God rising. We see the Spirit of God increasing. We see the Holy Spirit going from the Spirit into the heart. Now the Holy Spirit is then permeating and saturating and possessing our soul. As the cross does its work in our soul, as the cross does its work in our self-life, now it's making a way for the life of Jesus Christ to be fully released so that there's no obstruction, so that we can abide in the vine and stay connected to Jesus Christ all the time. It's a beautiful life. It's a beautiful life Jesus has called us to live. No longer living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, no longer living by brain power and knowledge and intellect and do good and be good and be moral and avoid evil and all that stuff. I'm not saying we, in our own power is what I mean. Is now we're living by the life source of Jesus Christ. His indwelling life is empowering us to produce the fruit of his life. We will produce the fruit of his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and all that Paul talked about as the fruit of the Spirit as the cross works in our soul. So here's what I pray in terms of how to kind of activate this in my own life. Father, I thank you, Lord, for cleansing my heart. Lord, I thank you for removing those things out of my heart, Lord, and strengthening my inner man. And I just want to pray right now, Lord, that you would do a work in my soul. Lord, I've been crucified with Christ. And when he died on the cross, I died with him. But I would just pray, Father, that this would become real within me. 
Holy Spirit, apply the cross to my soul. See, if you have trouble praying that, it's an indication of how much you really love yourself. (laughs) Sorry, didn't mean to make you feel bad, but that's the truth. When we struggle to say, God, let your cross work in me, is an indicator of self-love, self-preservation. But I just pray, Father, let the cross work in my soul. Let the cross work in my self-life. Let the cross break, remember the hard outer shell, let the cross break the pride, the independence, the rebellion, Lord, so that Christ and his indwelling life can flow and be fully released. Father, break that hard outer shell so that Christ can flow out of me. I want to live the exchange life. My self-life for the, for the life of Christ, I lay it down in Jesus' name. I just pray to live by the life of another. Now, when you pray that, I'm not going to promise you you won't experience some trials because <laughs> the Lord, it seems like the Lord, when you pray for prosperity or something like that, it takes years for that to happen. But when you pray for the cross to work in your soul, it gets answered immediately. So if, you, if you're struggling in your prayer life and you really want, God, would you answer my prayer? Okay, ask him to apply the cross to your self life and it will be answered immediately first class mail delivered the next day probably in an hour so in 30 minutes you know but that that work of the cross does an incredible thing in in removing those hindrances of pride and rebellion and all those different things that block the life of Jesus Christ now let's bring it back now to the abiding in Christ Um, that word abide means to stay and when you think about a branch you know, abiding is not really a word that we use very much at all. We don't say, hey, I'm going to abide here while you go there. We don't talk like that unless we're talking in the context of Christian teaching. But if you think of the branch connected to the vine, really what abiding, the way the Lord was using it, was meaning stay connected, stay attached, and don't let anything obstruct the life from flowing. Deal with the obstructions, deal with the blockages that block the life of God. Deal with those. That's basically what this is about. Let the pruning work happen in your soul and your heart so that there's no blockages, so you can stay attached and connected, body, soul, heart, and I'm not going to even say spirit because your spirit's already connected. You can stay connected in your heart, you can stay connected in your soul, and you can stay connected in your body by dealing with those things immediately, you know, whether it's unbelief or doubt or whatever would come, lust, whatever would come against you, deal with those radically, deal with those quickly, don't let them tarry. If doubt and unbelief is coming, uh, you know, into your life, battle that fast. If lust is coming against you, battle it fast. If pride is coming against you, battle it fast because those things, those enemies can obstruct and hinder the life of Jesus from flowing out of you. And so abiding is staying connected, staying attached. And and, and we're pulling, we're we're getting Christ to live. We're we're getting, we're drawing from his life source. Randall was talking yesterday at the work day. He was doing the power washing. And I just looked at him and was like, man, he looks like he's having a, I mean, really, I was like, he looks like he's really enjoying this. And, uh, you know, he's just got a kind of a smile on his face doing this mind-numbing task. And I was talking to him afterwards. He's like, man, you can just really commune with the Lord doing mindless kind of activities. And I was like, well, you know, you can, there, my driveway is available. If you want to commune with the Lord there, you can. But, you know, when, when we, we can abide with the Lord anywhere and any place. And, you know, it's just it's this, it's a, an incredible, beautiful thing. We don't have to go to church. Now, that doesn't mean don't come to church, but we don't have to connect with God. We can connect with God at any moment. And no matter all the time, we can live 
this life. This is what the Christian life is about. Drawing from the tree of life in you. Staying connected. Staying attached. Removing hindrances so that Christ in you can fully live. And so... The, 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 the life source of the Holy Spirit, the life source of Christ, His divine life produces fruit. His divine life produces love. See, you don't, if, if you're living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you see, okay, I've got to go love, and you go try in your own soulish, empathetic, human love to try to love somebody, and all you get is soulish compassion. Now, that's what you really need is you need the life of Christ. You need his love, not your soulish love. See, you need his joy, not your soulish joy. You're, you know, we don't even need God to give me joy or to give me love. We need Christ to be love and Christ to be joy. We don't need to say, God, give me peace. We need to say, Christ, be peace. We don't need to say, Christ, be humi give me humility, but Christ, be humility. We don't need to say, Christ, give me faith, but Christ, be faith in me. Because we're drawing from his life source. So, I mean, isn't this totally different than, this is so different than the way I've grown up, living 20, 15 years of my life. It's a, it's a total different way of living. We're living by a divine life. We're drawing from his life. It's beautiful. It, it, it is so incredible. And again, I'm only at the beginning of this. And so we'll end here with a prayer for abiding Jesus, you are the vine. Jesus, you are the tree of life. I'm asking you, Lord, that I would, you would help me to stay connected and attached to you. Lord, teach me. And I just want to encourage you, ask the Lord to teach you, because the Lord will teach you differently than he teaches me. Ask the Lord to teach you. You know, you're, we're, every one of us here, including myself, we are at the very beginning of truly learning how to abide and live by the tree of life. Ask the Lord to teach you. Lord, show me how to remain connected to you. All day, Lord, show me how to draw from the divine life, the life source. God, I exchange my self-life for divine life. Lord, remove every obstruction, remove everything, Lord, and teach me how to live connected to you. I pray. See, here's what happens when we learn to live this connected, attached life. Is Jesus said, then you will produce fruit, and then the Father will come with the work of the cross in your soul, and he'll prune you so you can produce more fruit. And this, the fruit is the life of Christ, and it's the works of Christ through you. See, so much of what, we've, so much of what I've done in the past has probably been my own soulish work. And in the kingdom, it really amounts for nothing. We don't need soulish work. We need Christ in us and his work in and through us. We need his divine life, his character, his nature producing. And so as we're producing fruit, the Father sees us. We're, you're, you are producing fruit. I see a little bit of fruit coming out. Now I'm going to bring the cross in a deeper way to cut out and cut away the obstruction so more fruit can come. And then I see more fruit coming. I'm going to bring the cross even deeper so much fruit can come. And I see now the fruit is coming and you're, you're, you're producing much fruit. Now I'm going to cut the cross even more so that you have fruit that remains. The fruit that remains is fruit that, that lives longer than you do. Not many Christians have fruit that outlives them. But God wants that for us. A legacy that we pass on to the next generation of a life that draws from the life of Jesus Christ. 
So we have fruit that remains, not only remains now in this life, but fruit that outlives us. It's the abiding life. And Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I said in, last week, Martha got a teaching about the resurrection. Mary, who practiced the abiding life, got a resurrection. When we abide in Christ and we have intimacy with him, our prayers will be answered. And I remember one time the Lord told me, I was like, God, you are not answering this prayer. You're not answering this prayer. And the Lord said, you're not abiding in me. You're not connected to me. And see, imagine what would happen, because really what the Lord's talking about in John 15 is really a picture of the church. It's not just the individual branch connected to the vine. It is the corporate ecclesia of many branches connected to the vine. You see that? It's the Lord's vineyard. And the Lord wants the ecclesia, the local church, connected as one body to that life source of Jesus Christ so that just like today in our church service, that was a beautiful picture of individual branches or individual members drawing from the life of Jesus Christ and then put together corporately, we had, it felt like heaven on earth. I mean, it was a beautiful time of the Lord moving. See, that's what this is about. If you abide in me and I abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. You want to see your prayer life move mountains? You want to see demons move when you pray? You want to see healing? You want to see things, situations change? You want to see things shift? It comes out of this living by his life, living by his indwelling life. Amen. Lord, I, I want to ask you, Lord, as we bring this to a close. Father, I ask you that we would live by the life of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, your life is so beautiful. Your life is so glorious, Lord. I ask you, Father, right now that you would train us and you would teach us. Lord, I'm asking you that for everyone listening, Lord, whether live or whether on audio. I ask you, Lord, that you would train and teach us how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Lord, we, all of us, myself included, we are at the beginning of the beginning of learning how to do this. Lord, teach us and train us. This is a whole new way of living. We're not used to living this way. We're used to living in the soul. We're used to living in the flesh. We're used to living this way. Jesus, would you teach us to live by your life so that we could produce the fruit and the nature of Jesus Christ? I pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we'll end the recording there. And... Uh,